Well, thank you all so much for coming. And I'd like to thank Fudo for hosting, providing food, and supporting us in all kinds of other ways. My name is Ian Clark. I'm the founder and architect of Freenet. Um, and I'll get started. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll start with a little bit of history to set the context. Um, I first kind of encountered the internet in, in the mid-1990s, which was around when it was first starting to enter the mainstream. And at that time, most people, I think, had the perception of the internet as this anarchic bastion for freedom of speech. People would say things like the internet roots around censorship. But I was studying computer science at the time, and I was learning about how the internet actually worked. And I realized that the reality of it was really the opposite. In fact, that the internet would be probably the most easily censored and controlled communication media that we'd yet created. And why is this? Well, I lay the blame at the client-server architecture. So the client-server architecture, you've got servers sitting in a data center somewhere, uh, which really control everything. They control the data. And you've got clients like a web browser or an email client, uh, which mostly act as a user interface for the user as they interact with, uh, with the server. And cut forward, uh, cut forward almost 30 years, and what the client-server architecture has given us has been this incredible concentration of power in, to, in the hands of just a handful of co companies which really control most, if not all, of the services that we use on a regular basis and the, inf and the infrastructure that that's built on. And, uh, and, so, and not, just, not just that, but these same companies that are dominant today are mostly the same companies that were dominant 10 or 15 years ago. And I think this speaks to a kind of stagnation that's occurred uh, with innovation, with the internet, and I lay that at the hands of this kind of original sin of a client-server architecture. Um, now, with, uh, with the client-server architecture, it's why did the internet evolve that way? Well, it's really two key reasons in my view. Number one, it's much easier to architect centralized services, client server services, because it's much easier to reason about what goes on when all of, the, all of the control resides in a server that sits on your hardware in your data center that you control. So it's easier to build things that way. And secondly, it's easier to monetize things that way. Because if, if you control the server, if you control what's going on, then you can erect toll booths to extract money out of your users, or you can inject advertising in order to sell uh, part of your user's attention to the highest bidder. So why, why decentralize the internet? Well, w to get rid of this tech oligarchy that none of us really chose, but we're all kind of stuck with wh whether you like them or not, to regain control of the communication technologies that we use. Um, to keep your data on your devices, because the only hardware that you can really, um, the only hardware that you can really trust is the hardware you own. Um, and so by decentralizing the internet, getting the control out of these data centers where you have to rely on these big companies um, to trusted devices that you own will be a, will be a big improvement. Uh, another characteristic of the way the internet has, has evolved is, this, is that it's become very siloed. So you've got, you know, you've got Yelp, which will not talk to Google reviews, for example. You've got different, you've got five different recommendation systems for different services, and all of these things do not talk to each other, and that's deliberate. There are really two key reasons. Number one, uh, these companies don't want to make it easy for people to automate interaction with their system because firstly that can make life easier for spammers but secondly it can undermine their business models and so these systems are not being designed with the user's best interest in mind they're being designed with uh, 
uh, these companies' best interests in mind uh, to, to really keep us trapped. And then by decentralizing the internet, we can move to a trustless security model where uh, data, data and systems can be secured through cryptography rather than by relying on the security of data centers and, and, and the people who are managing those data centers. So why hasn't somebody done this already? Well, if you're building a decentralized network, you need to be able to run code on untrusted hardware. And that, that's quite difficult. It's very difficult to design systems that way. Um, you also want to have equal responsibility between the participants in the system. So a lot of, um, a lot of systems today that are trying to kind of break this big tech monopoly, I'm thinking of things like Mastodon, rely on a federated approach where you have a privileged class of peer in the system and then everyone else is just kind of a, a normal user. But in my view, this is really just kind of going from a, a client and one server model to a client and many server model. Or you could look at it as going from a dictatorship to a feudal system. It really doesn't solve the problem. Um, a lot of the a lot of the things people are working on today are incomplete solutions. It's like instead, what people want is a car, but what these solution these solutions are crankshafts, uh, and it's some assembly required. And I think uh, you really need a, a kind of integrated solution that is end to end versus asking users to kind of cobble together. Uh, their own solution using these various uh, components. And also, if different people are creating these components, they really can't kind of fit together in the synergistic way that's necessary to make this whole thing work. And so we, we really need turnkey solutions. And then ease of use. Uh, I think back to the early 90s when uh, email was kind of starting to take off a couple of years before uh, even the web was taking off. And uh, some people developed this software, uh, Pretty Good Privacy, which allowed you to uh, use digitally sign and encrypt emails. But it really never gained much adoption. I'm sure there, there are probably a couple of people in this room who, who used it back then. But uh, aside from, shall we say, privacy or crypto enthusiasts, it never kind of broke out of that uh, uh, of that kind of silo. And the reason is it was just it was just difficult to use. And I think that the lesson is that if you can offer people security, you can offer people more control. But if they have to compromise on usability, it's not going to <clears throat> it's not going to gain mainstream adoption. And unless something can gain mainstream adoption, it can't really solve the fundamental problem that we're faced with right now. And then scalability. So uh, if you want this to achieve mainstream adoption, it needs to be able to scale to hundreds of millions, potentially even billions of users and peers using the network. And so if it's designed, for example, like, like the original uh, Bitcoin, where Every, it, which is a decentralized ledger where every transaction needs to be broadcast to every peer in the system, that just fundamentally limits scalability. And it, that might be okay in some circumstances. It works fairly well with cryptocurrency, but it's certainly not viable if you want to do things like building social networks or, or instant messaging systems. And there are things like L2, which try to address this, but it's really kind of lipstick on a pig. So where, do, where does Freenet drop in? So uh, the, way, the way things are at the moment, you've got your user, you've got your web browser, or that might be some native software s sitting on your computer, and then it communicates with web servers, uh, primarily using HTTP and WebSockets protocol these days. Um, with Freenet, it's it's a drop-in replacement. So the user, the browser, and the protocols, HTTP and WebSockets, they stay the same, but we put a, a, our software, we call the Freenet kernel, resides on the user's computer and communicates with their web browser using the protocols that 
web browsers uh, already know how to use, or it could communicate via local native applications, which again, communicate with the Freenet kernel uh, using uh, HTTP and WebSockets. And then Freenet provides a kind of gateway to this global peer-to-peer -peer network um, that users can use. But the point being that it's, it's a drop-in replacement, so we're not asking people to abandon the user interface they're familiar with, like, like the web browser. So fundamentally, what, what is Freenet from, a, from an architectural point of view? It's a decentralized key value store. So think, uh, think a simple database or a file system where you give it a file name and it gives you the data. That's a key value store. Uh, most databases are built on a type of key value store, potentially the, the file system itself. Um, but it's, it's completely decentralized, and I'll explain how, how we achieve that. Um, but and this is perhaps technically the thing that really kind of distinguishes uh, our approach from everything else, which is that keys in this key value store are WebAssembly code that determine what state, what value is permitted under this key and who and how that value can be modified and also how to efficiently propagate any changes to that data through the peer-to-peer -peer network. And then keys are identified just by a Blake 3 hash of, of the WebAssembly code itself. So the WebAssembly code defines what is a permissible, what is pr permissible state under this, uh, uh, we call the key contract. Um, and then we take a Blake 3 hash of that, which means that the identifier for this key is tied to the functionality of the key. If you change the WebAssembly code, the hash changes, the identifier changes. Uh, this key value store is observable. This is something even most modern databases can't do. You, in, in addition to being able to read the value associated with the key, you can also subscribe to it and be notified immediately, like within a second, if that value changes. And so that opens up functionality like instant messaging and group chat and, and many, many other things. And then another characteristic of this key value store is that it automatically replicates data in proportion to demand. So if, uh, let's say, if maybe one person is reading the data in a particular contract every day, that contract might just be replicated on a handful of computers. But if a million or 10 million people tried to access a particular contract, then this system would automatically replicate that contract ac across a large number of peers so that this workload is always being distributed relatively evenly among peers in the network, depending on their kind of individual capability, how much bandwidth they have available to them or how much, uh, what kind of machine they're running on. And then this, like I said, that this has to scale. And so um, our key value store is logarithmic, logarithmically scalable. So the same char scalability characteristic as, as a red black tree or, or any, any of the kind of data structures that, that solve this problem. And that means that we can pretty much scale indefinitely. Scalability is, is not a concern here. So how does this key value store work? Well, it, it relies on something called the small world, small world principle. So if you've heard the, the expression six degrees of separation, that's referring to the small world principle, which says that in a small world network, which is the network with a particular type of technology that I'll describe, um, you can get from any one peer in that network to any other peer in that network by routing through the network and at each stage just routing to the peer that is closest to the destination you're trying to get to. Um, so this was, there was an experiment done in, back in the 1960s by Stanley Milgram where he went to, I think it was Kansas, and he wrote the name and address of a bunch of people in Boston, Massachusetts on these letters. And he handed them out to people and he gave them one instruction, which was, you've got to get this letter to this person. This is somebody that they've never heard of. 
Um, but you can only get it to them by sending it to someone that you know personally. And they have to send it to someone they know personally and so on. So they, they sent out a bunch of these letters and then they saw the ones that arrived. And of, of the ones that made it, which I think most of them did, they only went through an average of six people in order to get to their destination. That's the origin of the phrase six degrees of separation. So I mentioned that this only works if the network has this small world property. And what that means very simply is that the closer you are to another peer in the network, the more likely you are to have a connection to them. Human relationships have this property, like you're a lot more likely to know your neighbor than you are to know somebody random on the, on the far side of the planet. So that's, that's why this works with human networks. And we understand the kind of mathematical property very well, and so it's possible to get artificial networks like this one to self-organize into small world networks so that this uh, scalable routing works. And so you can hear it, here you can see the process. It starts up at the top, and then it just this is just a two-step one, but it it um, uh, routes via this peer to get to its destination. Then it would retrieve the document and send it back along the same chain. Uh, this is something we've been using this the the original Freenet, which there's a long history there that I won't get into. But the the original Freenet I designed 23 years ago. Uh, was really the first system to use use this principle, and and we like to use what works and what we're familiar with. So so we're using the same approach. But this is quite similar to a distributed hash table. In fact, it's it's almost like isomorphic with with a distributed hash table. It's just kind of a different way of thinking about it, but it relies on the same underlying principle. Um, <clears throat> so a decentralized app, you're building a decentralized app in Freenet it really has three major components. So the first is, is the contract. This is the key in the key value store. Um, and you can see the yellow here represents untrusted hardware. So this is just running on peers in the network. You don't necessarily trust them. Bad people could potentially be, be running these peers. And so everything, everything a contract does is always being verified by other peers in the network. Um, and then, the second component is the delegate. And it, delegates are, in a way, almost like the opposite of contracts, where contracts run on untrusted hardware. Delegates run on your own computer within the Freenet kernel that I mentioned earlier. And delegates have the ability to both read and modify contracts. Uh, they have the ability to store secret data. So this is similar to a browser's local storage or cookie mechanisms. Uh, but delegates, a difference with browser uh, uh, cookies uh, is that delegates can actually do computations. So if you were storing a private cryptographic key in a delegate, um, instead of retrieving the key and using it, which is what you do with a web browser's local storage, with a delegate, you ask the key to sign or encrypt whatever it is uh, you want to sign or encrypt. And the delegate gets to decide whether it wants to do that. And so delegates allow you to encapsulate private data and control what that private data can be used for. Um, contracts, delegates are also implemented in WebAssembly. We use uh, WebAssembly more or less across the board. The exception being the third component, which is user interfaces. So a user interface uh, could uh, will typically just be running within the web browser. So this is a single page app. It could be implemented in something like React or Vue.js, or if you'd rather use Rust, you could compile it to WebAssembly um, and use it that way. But the web browser is able to do things like it can create delegates, it can communicate with delegates, it can create and read and modify contracts. They can really do everything. Um, but all while presenting a familiar user interface to the user. And you can use Bulma or like any of the multitude of uh, in-browser frameworks that people are familiar use with using. Um, <clears throat> now, so kind of drilling down a bit on uh, contracts. So if you're implementing a contract, there's several kind of, 
there are several types you need to be familiar with. The first is is the contract state. This is just the the data that's associated with the contract. This can be an this is an arbitrary block of bytes. How it's what serialization format you use, how it's encoded, all of that stuff is is entirely up to the contract. So we've at every step we've really tried to design the system like an operating system, where uh, it's it's as low level as possible, which means that you can write super efficient code. WebAssembly is extremely efficient, um, and so you can do kind of potentially quite complicated things, not just cryptography, but you could, in theory, do video transcoding, all, all kinds of stuff um, in WebAssembly. And so the state here is just an arbitrary block of block of bytes. Um, parameters, so a contract, these are configuration parameters for the contract, which actually form part of the contract itself. And so the identifier for the contract is a hash of the contract's WebAssembly code plus its parameters. And so if you were, for example, creating an inbox contract, which had a, a public cryptographic key, which was kind of the, the key associated with the inbox, that would probably be one of the parameters. And that allows people to reconfigure contracts without having to recompile their code. Um, a summary, this is, this is a, uh, a summary of the current state of state. Um, and this is kind of a compact way to say this is, this is what my state looks like right now. And I'll, the next slide, I'll, I'll get into the purpose of that. And then a delta, it, this is like a diff in programming. It's, it's the difference between two states. And the, the meaning, what these mean in the context of a particular contract is entirely up to the contract. The, in fact, all of these things are just blocks of bytes as far as uh, Freenet itself is concerned. Um, so if you're creating a contract, you need to implement several uh, several functions in order to define the contract's behavior. Uh, probably the most important is verify state. Uh, this is just, is this state permitted under this contract or not? So that might be something as simple, if it was, for example, a blog, um, it might be as simple as the state is a list of messages and each message must be di uh, digitally signed with this particular public key. Uh, you'll see that the, the parameters are also passed in into this. So if the public key is in the parameters, they can use it there. Uh, summarize state. Again, this is just given a state, create a summary, which, which is a compact way to summarize what is the state of the state at the moment. Um, and then you can use a summary to create a delta. Um, so the, the purpose of this is that, let's say, I'm a peer and I'm talking to another peer here and we both have uh, the same contract but we have different versions of the state and we want to efficiently synchronize the state between us. What, what I'll do is I'll create a, a summary of my state and I'll send it to the other person. They'll do the same thing with me and then we'll each create a delta which represents the difference between essentially what my state contains that the other person's doesn't, and vice versa. And that allows us to synchronize state across the network in a very efficient way. And the exact mechanism for that is left entirely up to the contract, because that's going to vary depending on, on the type of data that the contract's using. Datas can also, uh, deltas can also be independently verified. Um, because you don't want a situation, for example, where somebody is creating broken deltas and spamming the network with them. And so uh, every peer in the network, every peer in the network is constantly verifying everything because you can't trust necessarily that your neighbor is executing the contract code faithfully. Um, and so deltas can also be verified as well. And that means that broken deltas can't even begin to propagate through the network. And then, uh, and then you can also uh, apply a delta to the state in order to modify it. And so this is the last step of the synchronization process. And then there is a, I won't go too in depth on this because it's a little complex, but there's a mechanism called a related contracts function. And so if your contract 
receives a delta and it's deciding whether or not to apply that delta to its own state, what it can do is it can say, I want to I wanna check the state of one or more other contracts in order to determine whether I should apply this delta. And what that means, and this enables uh, really all sorts of things, it's a very flexible mechanism, but the primary motivation for this is to do things like spam filtering, so that, for example, and later on I'll, I'll kind of describe this in more detail, but you can do things like say, I'm only going to let you add your message to this inbox if it's got some kind of token that's going to prevent spamming. So it allows you to make the application of deltas to contract state conditional on the value of other contracts, which, which opens up a lot of flexibility. Contracts can essentially read each other's state within this specific con context. Um, so with any system like this, uh, an important question is, how do you maintain global consistency? You've got state on a bunch of different computers. Ideally, if everything's working well, then any change to state will propagate rapidly to any other peer in the network that is hosting that state. I use the analogy of a virus, which is kind of maybe not the best analogy to use given recent history, but it, it does spread through this network. Any change to state spreads through the network kind of like a virus. And so typically any changes will kind of be propagated everywhere that matters uh, within a second or two. Um, but that's not guaranteed. And so you need a solution to this consistency problem in order to, um, in order to make sure that the network doesn't kind of get out of sync or get into a state where different peers have different versions of the state and they have no way to reconcile that. And so one of the requirements that we place um, on contracts is that uh, if you look at that synchronization process as, as a way to merge states, then what we say is that the, that merge operation needs to be a commutative monoid, if anyone is a kind of fan of uh, category theory jargon. If, you, if you've never heard of it, don't worry about it. It's not, it's not that important. But what it means is that if you're merging states, like in this case, um, in this case, uh, maybe we've got kind of four different versions of the state. Uh, we merge A and B, and we get state E. C and D, we get F, and then they're merged together, together to get G. But let's say if we got these state versions out of order, um, well, we merge A and D. We haven't tried merging that before, so that gives us something we haven't seen before. H, C and B similarly. But then when we merge H and I together, we get back to G. So it doesn't matter. It's kind of like addition or multiplication in that it doesn't matter what order you merge states in. Um, you will achieve the same result. And so this is our solution to the eventual, consi this is what's called eventual consistency, and it's our solution to this consistency problem. Um, and so really what we're doing is we're kind of pushing the consistency problem uh, to the author of the contract, and they have the flexibility to solve that problem in a way that makes sense given the type of data their contract is, is dealing with. Um, yeah, so kind of go, going uh, going back here, uh, I'm going to drill into, dele that was contracts, I'm going to drill into delegates. Um, so delegates have an unbelievably simple uh, API, which is a delegate can receive messages and it can send messages. And it does all of that through by implementing this one function where it can receive multiple messages at a time and then it can respond by sending zero or more messages. And so these messages can do various things. A message might ask the kernel to retrieve the data in a particular state, uh, or it could s subscribe to the data in a particular state. It can also create contracts and uh, modify their state. Uh, delegates can also send and receive messages to and from each other um, and also to and from user interfaces that are running within the browser. 
Um, and delegates can also send a message to the users. So for example, if a delegate stored a, a private key um, and one of, let's say the user interface that I'm using wants to use that private key to sign something and it asks the delegate, the delegate can then ask me. And so the delegate has a way to direct questions to the user and that will be typically be using the built-in notification mechanism of whatever operating system that Freenet is running on. Um, so it's independent of whatever is going on in the web browser. Um, and that can also inform the user of, of events uh, that occur. And then one critical aspect of how delegates maintain security is that whenever a delegate receives a message, the kernel makes sure that it tells the delegate where the message came from. So if it came from another delegate, then the kernel says the hash of this delegate's WebAssembly code is this. And so the delegate can be certain it knows who it's talking to. And this is quite a different approach to most APIs. Most APIs, the API does not intrinsically know who is calling the API. Um, that's kind of supported independently. So this sender attestation uh, mechanism is uh, very powerful. And then the other thing, delegates are they're kind of like uh, uh, operating system demons in the sense that they can run in the background constantly. So if you're if your computer is on and uh, you've got Freenet running, your your delegates are running in the background all the time. And that means that, for example, if your delegate is doing something on your behalf, like monitoring your inbox. Uh, then that can happen all the time. But I mean, if your if your computer is turned off for a while and the delegates are not running, that's not not the end of the world. Uh, but they do, generally speaking, run in the background. Um, so, what does this actually look like? So this is a very simple, uh, well, relatively simple uh, example system that we've built on Freenet using the primitives I've just described, which is a simple email-like messaging system. Um, and you can see this is nothing very exciting, just kind of making the point that this kind of looks like every email client you've ever seen. Uh, this is using Bulma CSS, so this is kind of quite simple and minimalistic, but we can do anything a web browser can do here because it's just a web app running in a browser. So if you want to do some crazy web GL 3D stuff, there's no reason you can't do that. You can do anything a web browser can do uh, in a decentralized app running on Freenet. Um, and a kind of key problem with any messaging, really any messaging system at all, but particularly one which is decentralized, is what do you do about spam? Um, and so we, we've developed a, a simple spam prevention mechanism, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, it's got a familiar user interface. Like I said, it's all just all of the tools you're familiar with for building user interfaces. Again, this doesn't have to be running in a web browser. You could build a native app, and it could talk to the Freenet kernel over uh, web sockets. And as I'll mention later, the Freenet kernel is just a couple of megabytes, like this is a very small piece of software, so it's quite easy to bundle um, in larger software if, if you need to do that. Um, yeah, so the spam prevention mechanism we've developed, should do it on time. So the spam prevention mechanism, uh, we call them anti-flood tokens. And the idea with anti-flood tokens is first, a uh, user needs to create a token generator, and this is through some difficult process. And so the difficult process uh, initially is just you make a donation to Freenet, and we will use a blind signature in order to initialize your token generator. So we have no way to connect your donation transaction to your token generator. Obviously, this is, this is a centralized approach. Um, but we just wanted something kind of simple, and it does have the advantage of being anonymous, and it also has the advantage of helping to fund our project. Um, and so this token generator, once you initialize it, it will start to generate tokens at a regular interval. So it might be every five minutes, every 30 minutes, every hour. And these tokens will expire if they're not used. Uh, so in practice, most of them would probably expire. Um, 
there are several tiers of token, each generated at a different interval. So you might have a five minute token, which are very plentiful and therefore not worth very much. You might have a half hour token, which are more scarce. You might have a, a five hour token and so on. So in order to send somebody an email, for example, in this messaging application, you need to allocate a token. And the email inbox can specify what tier of token it needs to be. So if you're getting a vast amount of spam, you can just say, okay, I want to go from a five minute token to a 30 minute token um, and so on. And this, this is actually verified by that related contracts mechanism th that I mentioned. Um, and so because this increases the cost or limits the rate at which a potential spammer can spam you, it really kind of destroys their business model because their whole business model depends on being able to spam people at negligible cost per person. Um, and this is just a very simple example of a reputation system, but uh, you can conceive a much more sophisticated web of trust-based reputation systems that we're already working on that would be an even more sophisticated, uh, kind of a more general solution than spam, but it would obviously be usable for spam because somebody's reputation is just, I'm not a spammer. Um, so, yeah, so, so the inbox contract, which is kind of the heart of the messaging app, the contract state is a list of messages. Um, every message is encrypted using the using asymmetric cryptography, so it's it's encrypted using the public key that's associated with the inbox. So you can see you can see the inbox, uh, but you can't uh, you can't decrypt it unless you're the inbox owner. Um, what that does mean is that you you can glean some information about the inbox, like how many messages they're getting and approximately what size it is. Um, so that's a weakness of this particular design, but there are, there are kind of more sophisticated approaches to preventing that. But it does keep the, the email separate, uh, encrypted, which is important. Um, the contract verifies that there is a valid anti-flood token associated with the message. So if it doesn't have an anti-flood token or if it's expired or if it's not a high enough tier, uh, the contract will simply reject the message. And uh, yeah, and then the delegate, uh, the delegate is just constantly watching this contract. As soon as it sees a new message, it'll, it'll download it and remove it. So the public aspect of the inbox really will typically messages will just kind of appear and disappear fairly immediately. So there isn't, a, there isn't a hell of a lot for people to see. Obviously, somebody could monitor your inbox and glean some data about like approximately how many messages you're getting and their size. Um, but that's just kind of uh, a weakness of this kind of quite simple approach. Um, so what else could you potentially build on Freenet? Uh, we've really worked very hard to make it as general purpose as possible. Uh, so kind of very topical at the moment, you could build a decentralized Twitter on this where uh, the contract would just be your your timeline essentially on, on Twitter. Uh, people could subs subscribe, retweet, et cetera. You could pretty much do all of the functionality that, that Twitter provides or similar um, social networks like Facebook. Um, this is quite different. You could use a contract state as a buffer for uh, video or audio. And so this is where the, the efficiency of using WebAssembly comes in. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you could either do it just kind of point to point calls um, or you could do video and audio broadcast. Probably be a little bit slow to do a kind of one-to-one -one call because of that one second latency. If you were doing kind of point-to-point -point calls, what you would probably do is negotiate the connection over Freenet and then establish a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection. You could do live video broadcast, of course, the kind of one second latency is, is much less of an issue there. Um, uh, or it's kind of wildly different again, but imagine a Wikipedia that was entirely decentralized, including the editing process. 
So you could specify rules about who could edit and under what circumstances. You could potentially integrate it with a reputation system um, that would limit bad behavior and, and uh, make it easier for people with a good track record of editing uh, to edit more. Uh, you could build a search engine on top of this because the, the fundamental key value data structure, you can build other data structures on top of that, like a keyword index or, or maybe more sophisticated, some kind of uh, embedding-based um, uh, search system. Um, and then you could also build a recommendation engine, which search engine is a kind of recommendation engine that could potentially hook into a reputation uh, a reputation system um, so that instead of Google just deciding what search results should get prioritized according to uh, whatever criteria they want, um, in this case, uh, you, the recommendations, or sorry, the, the reputation system would ensure that the highest reputation search results are prioritized there. Um, so, where are we? Uh, where are we right now? So we've had a Rust development kit. We're implementing in Rust, uh, uh, although apps can be built in any language that compiles to WebAssembly. So that's assembly script, if uh, a JavaScript dialect or TypeScript dialect, uh, C, or really any kind of language with uh, that compiles to WebAssembly. So um, we started. We really kind of got this working so we could test it locally uh, about six weeks ago in July. Um, we got our messaging prototype working just about two weeks ago. We're working on the network now, so getting the actual decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network up and running, which will really be kind of the it's alive moment. Um, but that's our current focus. And as I mentioned before, the kernel software that needs to be installed on the user's computer in order to give them access to this entire system. Right now, it's running at just five megabytes, and I don't anticipate it'll get much better. That includes embedding a, a WebAssembly a compiler and all kinds of stuff. So one of the nice things about Rust is that it uh, you can really kind of slim down the binaries, which is, which is very important for us. Um, and I think i uh, open it up for questions. Um, Peter. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that you are enforcing uh, commutative monoids uh, on there. Um, so one one little uh, correction is uh, actually uh, it's originally from uh, abstract algebra, not category theory. Mm. But uh, um, the uh, um, I, I'm wondering how you enforce that. So it, that's it's not enforced, but if a contract that doesn't meet that criteria will, will simply be incorrect. Mm -hmm. And so the responsibility for that is really up to the contract author. Mm -hmm. um, and if you create a broken contract, people just aren't going to use it. So we're, we really try to make the system as flexible as possible. Now, if contracts do things, if contracts misbehave, like if they uh, start kind of doing a bunch of updates or kind of request a million related contracts or various other kinds of abuse. What we do is is we tr we keep track of the resources used by every contract, whether it's bandwidth, CPU, uh, storage, etc. And if a contract is using a disproportionate amount of resources relative to how useful it is, which is basically how many people are using the contract, then a peer will remove it. So the, the um, community of monoid thing, it's, it's not explicitly enforced. But if you don't do that, your contract will simply be kind of broken. And uh, it's kind of buyer beware in terms of people using the contract. OK. That makes sense. Yep. Any other questions? Um, okay. I have, I have a question. Oh, um, yeah, please. How much state do you have to like hold on to? Like, you mentioned like the state. Like, so like if I was to be running it on my system, and I would, would you have like, five apps or so, like how much storage would I have to have to like hold the state in of these apps? Yeah. So so the the contract state that's all out on the network, <laughs> and so 
if you're if you're creating the app, you don't uh, you just kind of, it's kind of fire and forget. You put it in the network, and then you can shut down your computer. Um, with delegates, that does actually reside on your computer, um, but typically these are not going to require. It's going to be a couple of kilobytes, maybe a couple of megabytes in the um, at the high end. But it's on a modern or even a modern phone, it's not going to be a significant amount of storage. So if I was to be running on my own system, I don't have to hold onto the state. Like only if I'm a delegate, I have to hold onto the state. Yeah. So so a delegate, because they they reside on your own computer, they kind of uh, need to stay on your machine. If you're um, with a contract state, that's all kind of out in the network. Now, if you want to make sure it stays in the network, you can do something called pinning, uh, where you would keep it on your computer. But really, all that's going on there is that your computer is making sure that if the contract falls out of the network, it will put it back in. Um, but generally, the people who create uh, uh, the people who create particular contracts don't necessarily have to. Uh, maintain that contract on their system unless they want to really guarantee that it doesn't fall out of the network, which will only do if nobody else is using the contract. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Okay. Right, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, so, if you want to recompute the state of the network, does that not require you to store all the contracts? The network doesn't. The network does not have one global state. Um, it's more like state is kind of local. State is local to the contract. Um, so there's no point at which, I mean, I guess in theory, you could crawl the entire network and get a complete copy of the state of all contracts right now. You could do that in theory, but um, uh, I'm not sure why why anyone would do that. So it's not, there isn't one kind of Global state. Its state is, I think, state is local to a contract. If that makes sense. Well, like if you had like a Twitter feed example where you had like several contracts that were interdependent on each other to like track the sharing and likes, and mm -hmm. you have to store the state of all the contracts because they're inter like you, if you have interdependent contracts, you mm -hmm. have to store every contract, right? Yeah. So, so in in the Twitter example, each each timeline like. Each Twitter handle would have a contract where the state would just be a list of the tweets uh, for for that state, uh, for that person. Um, but if you're doing something like, let's say, you retweeted you retweeted someone else, then you'd really just kind of you're really just rebroadcasting one of their posts under your own contract state. Um, so, so are you duplicating state at that point? Uh, in that, well, th there are different ways you could do it, but yeah, because tweets are so small, it, it would really be quite easy just to to duplicate the state. And I think that's actually what Twitter does when when stuff is retweeted. Um, although it does actually, that's not true because it does point to the other state. Um, so I think either the concern would be, let's say you retweeted some state and it. Uh, the original tweet fell out of the network, for example, because nobody cared about it. Um, I think the way you would design that would be you would make you would keep a copy of that um, the tweet you're retweeting in your contract, uh, and then if the original state fell out of the network for whatever reason, your system would then have the ability to put it back in. Um, and so that would almost be a kind of similar to the pinning mechanism, where it's like I'm going to refer to this, but I've also got a local, I've also got a copy of it, so that if the original disappears, I can modify it. But if the original is updated, I will modify my version um, itself. So like these things can all kind of maintain pointers to each other, but you design it in such a way that if you're pointing to something that falls out of the network, you've got it. You maintain a copy of it so that you can put it back in. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the concern is kind of like if you repost a tweet and then the original author of the tweet edits that tweet, mm -hmm. the contract is untrusted. So mm -hmm. you have to verify that when the contract accepted the edit, 
it properly validated the key, mm-hmm. which authored the edit, mm-hmm. which means that you have to you have to store both contracts. That way you can validate the state transition of both for yourself. Yes, that, so that's a very good point. Yeah, so in that situation, and, and the way we're designing it is that it's very, very cheap to do things like that. So, so the related contract mechanism, you maintain a connection to the original contract. You would subscribe to the original contract um, such that if it was updated, you could make the update and you can verify the update yourself because the edit like you said, would need to be digitally signed and it would have uh, a date so it would know that it would prioritize the most recent edit. Um, but because, particularly with tweets, you're dealing with 140 characters, it's, it's quite cheap to kind of maintain copies of these things uh, as a kind of guarantee just in case the original falls out of the network. Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess my second question is like on the way the tokens work. Um, it kind of sounds like a proof of authority based architecture where like free debt's operating as a foundational proof of authority uh, ledger. In that situation, in that scenario, yes. Like that's a centralized approach. So it's kind of, that's more of a, a what can we build that will work quickly that won't be too complex. Um, but that's not a, a, ideally everything should be decentralized. That's just more of a kind of way that we can solve the problem early on and then later we could come up with and you could i don't like proof of work because it's wasteful but you could very easily create a proof of work based system to increase the cost of uh creating these token generators or there are more uh there are more interesting approaches that that we've been toying around with like that would require uh, if you want to create a new token generator, you would need two existing people to play this kind of game that would require trust between them, almost analogous to two humans having a kid. Like it, it's, it's something that kind of requires a lot of um, uh, reciprocal trust. Um, so there, there are a lot of different ways to do that in a completely decentralized way, but you're absolutely right. What, what I just described is centralized but with the benefit of anonymity because of the the blind signature uh one more um have you heard of like risk zero and like what was kind of the i know that you are using blake three to like hash the actual assembly so you can validate i find that to be like a bit confusing wouldn't it be more helpful to like generate a zk on the fact that the contract operator actually executed the instructions like faithfully um i in a in a perfect world yes but at least from uh, what i understand of ck it's not computationally feasible to do like there there there's some things you can do but it cannot do general purpose computation um have you looked at risk zero uh no i haven't i haven't but definitely check it out if uh yeah what was it r-a-s-c yeah yeah like basically like you can generate a zk that you executed arbitrary risk five instructions oh okay. which should give you turn completeness and oh, it might okay. be a good alternative to like the blake three approach mm. on the hashing interesting yeah. yeah i'll definitely check that out yeah I appreciate like, it. Well, yeah. any other questions okay i'll wrap it up thank you very much